morning. Ah, good. It's amazing. I say good morning and the music stops. I, I want that at home. Uh, welcome to our session this morning on the evolution of consciousness. Uh, I think we're all here probably for similar reasons. We, there's a kind of, and, and, and I'm sure we've all picked it up this week in Davos, this kind of free-floating anxiety <laughs> about, um, you know, if AI is going to be the answer to everything, machine learning is going to outthink us, um, <coughs> robots, what, what, what's to become of us human beings? What, what is work going to look like? You know, is there, is there a place in the world that, that we've created? Have we sown the seeds of our own destruction, I guess, is, is, is the question at the core of this. And we're going to talk about consciousness, human consciousness, the nature of it, and how it evolves, does it evolve. With me today, I'm Amy Bernstein, I'm the editor of Harvard Business Review. But with me today are, and I just, I'm doing this because I don't want to miss the proper titles and affiliations. All the way to my left is Jody Halpern, who is a professor of bioethics and medical humanities at Berkeley. Next to her is Yuval Harari, professor of history at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And closest to me is Dan Dennett, who is a professor of philosophy at Tufts. Welcome. Great to be here with you. So I am going to quote something to you that I read in an article from Wired, which you know, kind of gave me nightmares. Um, it said, countless numbers of intelligences are being built and programmed. They are not only going to get smarter and more pervasive, they're going to be better than us and they'll never, uh, and they'll never be just like us. That was a Freudian slip that I couldn't get that one out. So, Dan, I'm going to start with you. Here's a little question. What is consciousness? Oh, oh that's an easy one. Thank you, Amy. <laughs> let, let, let's land that Do you a want little. the 10-second answer or the 10-hour answer? <laughs> well, actually, so let me help yeah. focus that. I was, I was only half yeah. kidding. That's a Davos joke, I guess. Yeah. Um, how far has science gotten us to understanding the basics of consciousness, what consciousness is at its heart? Um, and, 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 and talk about that. Well, actually, I'll, I'll save that question for you, Jody. Go ahead, Dan. Um, it's making great progress. I think in my career, uh, there was a period when it was considered off limits to talk about it for scientists to talk mm -hmm. about it. But that's changed in the last 25 years, and now there's a regular gold rush on. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of good work being done, and there's a lot of controversy, and there's a lot of, of big egos fighting it out at the top. Mm -hmm. but, but we're making real progress, and I think that uh, uh, the ideas for a proper confirmed scientific theory of not just human consciousness, but animal consciousness, and by extension, machine consciousness, if that's possible. Uh, uh, we're, uh, stay tuned, it's, it's, things are happening very fast well, can these you, days. Can you bring it into semi-focus for us? Um, what, what consciousness in a, there are many different meanings, there's just plain sentient, and even, even plants are sentient. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but they're not conscious in any, sensible sense. Um, it's a, an open-ended capacity to represent your own representations and reflect on your own reflections. And it's, it's what gives us the power to imagine counterfactual futures in great detail and think about them, for instance. That's, that's just one of the things that consciousness in us can do. That very fact of, of uh, imagining non-existent states of affairs distant in time and space, for instance, we have no reason to believe that any other species is capable of that. Mm -hmm. That really is a, uh, we, that might prove to be wrong, but uh, yes, and it might prove that some moon somewhere is made of green cheese, but uh, I don't think it's very likely. Okay. How does that sound to you, Yuval? What would I think about the same question? Yeah. yeah. Well, um, 
I think that there's a lot of confusion between intelligence and consciousness, mm. uh, especially when it comes to artificial intelligence. I would say that intelligence is the ability to solve problems. Consciousness is the ability to feel things, to have subjective experiences like love and hate and fear and so forth. Um, the confusion between intelligence and consciousness is uh, understandable because in humans, they go together. We solve most problems uh, through feelings. Um, but in computers, they could work in, they could be completely separated. Mm -hmm. So we might have super intelligence without any consciousness whatsoever. I agree. Mm -hmm. Jody, do you agree? And, uh, yeah. and what about when we, when we sort of connect this to empathy, which is really your, your field? Do, do you think that we're getting any closer to understanding that? Yeah, I think, by the way, one of the great things about AI, thank you, one of the great things about AI is not uh, our increased understanding of it. I mean, that's great. A lot of you work in that area, but it's, it's causing us to be much more precise in our questions about ourselves, mm -hmm. which I think is great. Um, and what I, what I think is that, uh, as a, I'm a psychiatrist, philosopher of emotions, ethicist, so I have to say part of what I think people are really worried about is, not, is neither consciousness or intelligence, but the self. Mm. And what is the self? And will we be able to become, will that be replaced? So how, and, do you, how do you differentiate among those? Well, I think that the way that you've all just defined consciousness, which is different than Daniel's definition of consciousness, mm -hmm. is closer to my definition of the self. So we're just, I don't care about the semantics. So I think we're, we're pretty compatible, I think, in our views of a lot of this. But I think that what I would just point out is that I know there are people, even at Davos, who are creating uh, companies to try to create empathic AI, mm -hmm. and I really agree with Daniel that that's a big mistake, that we really should be using uh, uh, AI as a tool, not as a companion. And I can talk forever about why I think that's the case, but I'll just give you a quick two things. Mm -hmm. So I'm a teacher, I'm a Berkeley professor, and I, I've been teaching doctoral students in the, in the sciences ethics for a long time. So for 20 years, I've asked the same question the first day I meet with the doctoral students, who are very good scientists. And I say, if you could have a little electrode planted, by the way, 20 years ago, I didn't know we'd be able to do this. <laughs> it was a thought experiment. I said, if you could have a little electrode planted in your brain that would make your crucial life, they're at a stage of life where they're making very important existential decisions, who to, who to marry, who, whether to have children, what careers to do. And I, I would said to them, if your electrode would make the right decisions for you and you would have a happy outcome, a better life, um, would you do it? And I just did this, you know, four days ago again with my new course at Berkeley. I've done this every year. And every year, every single person says no. And I think that's incredibly interesting. And so there's two ways of thinking about ethics. And one is outcomes-based, only utilitarianism, consequentialism. And another way of thinking about what we as selves and persons care about is goes beyond just happiness maximize as an outcome, but the kind of processes we live our life through. Are we autonomous? Are we agents? And I would say even more than autonomy and agency, what is our relationality? How do we relate to others and how do others, how do we encounter others and make decisions and be with others? And I have to say one thing that's very shocking. This year, learning more and more about it, where AI is at, I actually think my students are wrong. I think I'd say yes to the electrode because I, and this is where I'm on the same page, I think that with enough, I mean, not today, not the AI of today, but if there is an AI, this is not AI that would do empathy, I think that there is an AI that could make good decisions for Jody. This is more about agency and autonomy. I think if it knew everything about, you know, everything I've ever been through and how the world is changing and everything about my physiology and how, and you can tell, basically what, you asked me what empathy is mm -hmm. and my whole career is, saying what I think it is and what keeps changing. But the main thing is there's two parts of it. Mm -hmm. And one part of it is being able to really sort of micro recognize other people's internal worlds. Mm -hmm. And I am now convinced with the two of you that AI could in principle do that. But the other part of it, that's I'm a psychotherapist as well, so what, what makes empathy transformative in psychotherapy? One part of it is that the therapist recognizes what you're going through in ways you may not even recognize. And I think we do have, by the way, Stanford cut a whole weekend on this that I worked with them. There is AI psychotherapy now already. And it's like a smart journal. And I'm not against that with people that are not demented or not children and can really understand that this is just a smart journal that can tell them their reactions. But the other part of really transformative psychotherapy is the co-vulnerability that you know it's actually another human who is subjectively experiencing the gravity 
of what you've been through and in a being with experience accompanying you. Actually, we have Matteo Ricard here who knows about this. And that is really, in a scientific level, a lot of what my whole career has been showing the value of that. And I'm not going to even say whether AI I could ever do that or not, because it would have to be sentient in all these ways. But what I'm saying is we don't want it to. We want to do what humans are good at, and that's what humans can do. And when we lose all the jobs we're going to lose because of AI doing mechanical things, I want AI doing the care giving, the elder care, the child thing. I don't want AI doing that. I want us to be doing the humanizing thing. And that co-vulnerability of other humans and being with, that's what humans do best. And I've talked a long time, but I'll just say something really provocative. And one of our articles related to this, I think we're good at it because we're not logical. I, this is a very bizarre thing to say, but I think it's the glitches in us, in, which are related to our finitude, that make us really feel understood by each other. We empathize most around each other's mistakes, each other's ridiculous suffering. And I think that it's a, it's a, it's a fool's task. That's just exactly what we're not needing AI for. But to make smart decisions, I trust AI, but not to understand me and help me transform and feel related to. Go uh, ahead, Dan. I think that uh, a point you made about vulnerability I want to return to. It seems to me that in the foreseeable future, uh, AI systems are going to be tools, not colleagues, not and the key point there is that we, the tool users, are going to be responsible for the decisions that are made. And if you start thinking about an AI as being a responsible agent, you put consciousness aside and just say, well, it's an intelligent agent, but can we, can we make it a responsible agent? Uh, I co-taught a seminar, a, a course on autonomous agents in AI a few years ago. And as an as a assignment to the students, I asked them not to make one of these, but simply to give the specs for an AI that could sign a contract. Not as a surrogate for some other human being, but in its own that, that, was, a, that was legally, a, 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 a child or a demented person can't sign a contract. They're not viewed as having the, the requirements of moral agency. And you ask yourself, what would an AI be that had the requirements for moral agency? And the point that they gradually all groped to was, it has to be vulnerable like us. It has to have skin in the game. And right now, AIs are unlike us in a very fundamental way. You can reboot them, you can copy them, you can put them to sleep for a thousand years and wake them up. They are sort of immortal. And making them so that they have to face their finitude of life the way we do is a tall order. I don't think it's impossible, but I think that nobody in AI is working on that or thinking about that. And in the meantime, they are engaging in a lot of false advertising, which, which I, one of my all-time heroes is Alan Turing. Uh, I'm right up there with, with, with Darwin. And Turing was a brilliant man. His famous Turing test, which I'm sure you all know about, had one unanticipated flaw. By setting up this litmus test for intelligence as an opportunity for the computer to deceive a human judge about its humanity, it put a premium on deception, a premium on seeming human that is still being followed in the industry. And everything from Siri on down and up, have, they have these disnified humanoid interfaces. And those are pernicious because, I mean, one thing that my sort of whole career is based on is the idea of the intentional stance, where you 
take something complicated and you make sense of it by considering it as a rational agent with beliefs and desires. And when we do that, we always are overcharitable. We always in, imagine more comprehension, more <coughs> understanding, more rationality than is actually there. And rather than fostering that by having these oh so cute and friendly uh, interfaces, they should, it should be like the pharmaceutical companies. They should have to remind every user of all the known glitches and, and incomprehensions in the areas that the system was absolutely clueless about. And of course, that would run on for pages and pages <laughs> and pages. So we'd have to find some substitute for that. So until we're ready to have AIs that you would be comfortable and rational making a promise with or signing a contract with, then we've got to remember we're the ones, the buck stops with us. Whatever advisor, we may have a very intelligent advisor, but when it comes to acting on that advice, we shouldn't duck responsibility. And as long as we maintain our own moral responsibility for the decisions we make aided by AI, uh, I think that's a key to uh, keeping us in the driver's seat. Do you agree, Yuval? Well, I'll, I'll take the AI's position. And <laughs> I'll, I'll point out that uh, humans are not very good in decision making, especially in the fields of ethic, ethics. And the problem today is not so much that we lack values, is that we lack understanding of cause and effect. In order to be really responsible, it's not enough to have values and responsibility. You need to really understand the chain of causes and effects. Mm -hmm. Now, our moral sense evolved when we were hunter-gatherers, and it was relatively easy to see the chains of causes and effects in the world. Where did my food come from? Oh, I hunted it myself. Where did my shirt come from? Either I made it or my family or friends made it. But today, even the simplest question, where does this come from? I don't know. It will take me, I guess, a year at least to find out who made this and under what conditions and was it just or not just. The world is just too complicated. In many areas, not in all areas, but in many areas it's just too complicated. And when we speak, for example, about contracts, so I sign contracts almost every day, like I, I have this applic new application and I, I, I switch it on and immediately a contract appear. And like pages and pages of legalese, uh, me and I guess almost everybody else, we never read a word. <laughs> I mean, we just click, <laughs> I agree, and that's it. Right. Now, is this responsibility? I, I, I'm not sure. I think one of the issues, and this comes back to the issue of self, is that over history, we've built up this view of life as a drama of decision making. What is human life? It's a drama of decision making. And you look at art, so any Hollywood comedy, any Jane Austen novel, any Shakespeare play, it boils down to this great moment of making a decision. Do I marry Mr. Collins or the other guy? I, I forgot his name. Um, uh, to be or not to Don't be? Receive. No, no, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Do I kill King Duncan? Do I listen to my wicked wife and kill King Duncan or not? And the same with religion. I mean, the, the big drama of decision making, I will be fried in hell for eternity if I make the wrong decision. And it's the same with modern ideologies that democracy is all about the voter making the big decisions. And uh, in the economy, we have the, the customer is always right. What is the customer's choice? So everything comes back to this moment of decision. And this is why AI is so frightening. I mean, if we shift the authority to make decisions to the AI, the AI votes, the AI chooses, then what does it leave us with? And maybe the mistake was in framing life as a drama of decision making. Maybe mm. this is not what human life is about. Maybe it was uh, a, a, a necessary part of human life for thousands of years, but it's not really what human life sh should be about. Jody? Yeah, I love this discussion, by the way. I'm, this is 
we, we've guess. never all been together either. <laughs> um, and uh, I actually think there's a deep, I mean, I sometimes, I hope it's fun for you guys because sometimes it's more fun if we're fighting. <laughs> but um, I mean, I feel like you guys are writing next sentences in my head. Um, I love this discussion and I want to try to synthesize it. Mm. So, and this goes to what I think you started and, well, I think that we think what we really need maybe at Davos and other places to have much deeper thinking about ethics and, and this notion of responsibility. And we need to make progress in that notion. But basically, let me suggest to you that we too often think that the responsibility is a what the cause of something is, is what's responsible for it. But that's not necessarily true. That's where, where Dan was getting us started. Role responsibility can be independent of causality. So what do I mean by that? I mean, my example is paper I wrote on bullying. If, you know, if kids, little kids bully each other and cause tremendous problems, because that causes long-term health and mental health problems, the little kid can't be responsible because they didn't have agency autonomy. But the school is responsible because, and the parent and the school system for, they're, they're the, the, um, the party that requires the kid to be in school, be exposed to the other kids in the first place, and has to really, help each child have a right to an open future, et cetera, et cetera. But the, the responsibility lies in the role of being the parent, the school, et cetera. And I understand the point of who created the jacket in the first place. So it's not, I'm not saying this neatly tidies up every small question, but I think that I love Dan's point that our vulnerability and our responsibility are connected. That's where I'm going as well with my work. But the point is we can't, so I, I and I've written about how bad, I, I did a whole three year project on how bad humans are at decision making. That's why I disagree with my students. I want that electrode advisor. But no matter what, even if it had, I mean, even if it let it work where it did the decision, even if it causally overrode me, I still would be morally responsible because of my role responsibility to myself. <laughs> and I want to say one last thing. I also agree, though, with Yuval's point that the focus on decision making and ethics and what we are as persons has been really misplaced. Yeah. Because our roles play out in how we empathize and relate to each other every day and what we do and what we create and don't together, not in these just very dramatic decisions. Yeah. Um, one of the things we have to realize is that our current views which may be out of date, may be on the way out, may be on the point of extinction. Our current views about responsibility and decision making are held in place by a dynamic uh, feedback system. We educate our children to become moral agents. We try to give them a sense of taking pride in, in being responsible for the decisions they make. That's part of a moral education. So what, if we're talking about overthrowing that, we're talking about a, a, a truly revolutionary, uh, really a sort of an extinction event. It would be the extinction of persons as, as responsible agents, which is, hmm. which is pretty serious. Um, a question along those lines that I have for you all is, okay, so you've got this super duper AI of the future that's got this wonderful ability to predict cause and effect. And uh, it also, of course, has to have some set of values in order to say what a, why one outcome is better than another. Mm -hmm. I think there's already problems there. Let me give you a, an aside. Three Mile Island, how many years ago did that happen? 30, something like that? Um, if, you're a, if you're a consequentialist, was that a good thing to happen or a bad thing to happen? If you'd been the engineer who could have pushed the button to prevent Three Mile Island from happening, knowing subsequent history, would you not push the button or would you push the button? The idea that we can be consequentialists, the big flaw in that, I think, is that consequentialism works great in games like chess where there's an endpoint and you can, you can work back from that and figure out whether this was a good move or a bad move. But in life, there are no endpoints. And that means that the whole idea of totaling up the good against the bad, it's a fool's errand. You can't do it. Hmm. You simply can't do it, and neither can any AI. But I'm going to suppose for a moment that an AI could, and it did its calculation, and it said to Yuval, after due consideration, 
Here is the morally best thing to happen. The human race extinguishes itself. So you say, gotcha. That's what we're going to do. <laughs> right? No, I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm following the, I mean, the, the relevance to the kind of argument that we are having here. I mean, it doesn't matter what kind of, uh, you, you can start with any set of values. Um, the idea is that you could program the AI to follow your particular set of values. So well, even if you have a principle. Yeah. yeah, I mean, everything here is, 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 is <laughs> theory. We are still not there with yeah. this kind of AI. Of course, if, we, if you couldn't do it, if you can't program values into the AI in any significant way, then the entire discussion is, is, is irrelevant. But even if people say, oh, but we won't say, I don't know, serendipity, like, okay, let's start with something easier than, than, than destroying the whole human race, just letting the AI pick my music for me, something much more, much more simple. And people say, no, that's bad. We shouldn't give the AI the authority to pick music for me because then I lose serendipity and I, I, get, I get trapped inside the cocoon of my previous preferments. But that's so easy to solve. You just find out what is the exact, not, not even the exact, what is the ideal zone of serendipity because if it's 50% serendipitous, it's, it's too much noise. If it's, if it's zero, it's too little. Let's say you have all these experiments and you realize that the ideal level of serendipity for humans or even for me personally is 7%. You just program this into the AI and 93% of the music is based on my previous likes and dislikes and 7% is serendipitous completely. It guarantees more serendipity than I could ever accomplish myself. So even these kinds of arguments, okay, you like serendipity, no problem. Just, just uh, insert the numbers into the AI. So well, the, the, the serendipity, uh, yes, you can get a variety of serendipity where you can sort of set it on the dial. How much do you want? Mm -hmm. But it's not clear that you're not paying a big price when you do it that way, as opposed to, well, I, to take an example along these lines, I, in my uh, student days and early professor days, very often went hunting in the stacks in the library for a particular book and found books shelved nearby mm. that hugely changed my intellectual life. <laughs> right. <laughs> and How close do you think your serendipity algorithm mm -hmm. can get to recreating that kind of serendipitous possibility? Do you think, oh yeah, we can do that. It's just a matter of tuning. Well, this particular case, yes, I guess they could do it. I mean, not me, I don't know how to code. But uh, <laughs> they, you just say, okay, so you find the best book according to my criteria, and then you go to the Library of Congress you find out which books are on the, on the shelf ne nearby and give me those. Oh, but wait a minute. Uh, one, of, one, of, one of the things that I would be quite sure of is that sometimes I would pull a book down, not because I thought, ooh, that looks right down my alley, because, but no, <coughs> that can't be right. <laughs> this goes against everything I've ever valued. Mm -hmm. And then, open it up and been challenged and that's not going to appear on my, on my short list on your, in your serendipity algorithm because <coughs> it's too closely tuned to my existing sets of preferences. Mm -hmm. This is, a, this is a, the possibility of a revolutionary change in my preferences and uh, uh, one can say, well, We'll just leave it to. We'll just leave that to chance. We'll we'll put in some super serendipity. Uh, yeah, you can you can do that, but um, uh, maybe it's better to have a way of uh, encountering in the actual real world these opportunities rather than having them carefully dished out to you by one algorithm or another. Um. Yeah, in, in principle, yes, but I think that all these kinds of discussions about the problems and limitations of AI, I think in many cases the AI is tested against an impossible 
uh, an impossible yardstick of perfection, yeah, yeah. whereas it should be tested against the uh, fallible yardstick of human beings. It's like the discussion about self-driving cars, that people come up with all these scenarios of what could go wrong with self-driving cars. And it's certainly true. A lot of things not only can, but will go wrong with self-driving cars. They will kill a lot of people. But then we just have to remember, oh, but today, 1.25 million people are killed each year by car accidents, most of which are caused by human beings who drink alcohol and drive, or who text messages while driving, or just uh, don't pay attention. So even if, uh, if self-driving cars kill 100,000 people every year, that's still far, far better than the situation today with, with human beings. So, and, and, and I think that this is what we need to, 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 to the same kind of, of um, more realistic approach should be adopted when we consider the um, uh, benefits and limitations of AI also in fields like choosing music or uh, choosing friends and even, even spouses. How about choosing medical diagnoses and treatment? Um, the advances in AI and medicine are truly, yeah. truly impressive, and they're getting better and better. And uh, I think this is, in general, a wonderful thing. I don't think people are doing a very good job of, of uh, accounting for the downside. Uh, today, still, the life of a physician is one of the most attractive, exciting, glorious, reward-filled, gratifying lives on the planet. That's not, that's gonna change. The physician in the very near future is gonna be more like the doorman in an expensive apartment building. <laughs> Great bedside manner, very good at pushing a few buttons, and very good at explaining to you what the machine says. Is that the life you want for your children? Well, I want to see if Jody agrees with that. You managed to come up with something to disagree with me about. <laughs> okay, good. He's a hero of mine. Um, I, I think, I, first of all, I want to say, I, like, I just ha I'm just too much of an ethics teacher. I feel like I have to make the audience realize what happened in these transitions. <laughs> so <laughs> what happened is we were talking about two different philosophical, ethical views of the world. One is consequentialist utilitarian, where the outcome maximization which is what we're always doing, the maximizing efficiency of positive over negative, measurable happiness, blah, blah, blah. And the autonomous vehicle points that you just made are about that. We will be better off with autonomous <laughs> vehicles. So the other point that Dan was making about the library was that even if it somehow had the right serendipity to give him some kind of happiness outcome of books, the experience of being involved in his own transformation from this other ethical system of selves and persons and having, which goes with moral responsibility as well, which is this other ethical, it's called deontology, the study of duties, but we don't think of it as the study of rights, human rights, individual rights, but that the processes of life, life, not deceiving each other, caring for each other, these things matter independent of consequences or not just because of consequences, that's another thing. We want to have our own vulnerable, frail lives, make our own mistakes, love the people we love, because that's, human, that's being human, not just maximizing an outcome. That's what the, tr the logical shift that we made in a sneaky way, so you know that. So then the question is, what, will, what does being a doctor have to do with that? So I still think, first of all, I do, I, I'm a psychiatrist, so not only is AI already better at reading x-rays, and in the um, national, health system in the UK better at deciding when you need dialysis. So that's a decision, but it's actually, to my incredible astonishment, already better at predicting suicide, which has been the biggest problem in psychiatry. No, there's been no way to predict when a person who feels suicidal, has suicidal intent or ideation is actually gonna complete a suicide. Biggest problem in psychiatry, AI's not perfect at all, it's like the car thing. I don't know if it's as good as cars yet. I doubt it's as good as cars, but it could get that good. Um, but the point is that's amazing, right? That's such an existentially interesting thing that AI is already good at. And like I said, I'm already different than my students. I'll let AI advise my decisions. I'm certainly gonna want it to decide people's cancer treatments and their psychiatric hospitalizations and all of that. 
as long as it's better than we are, because I want. That's where you're looking for a good outcome. But are you going you're to looking, be a highly educated yeah, doorman? Door yeah. No, no. Okay, thanks, Amy. But <laughs> the point is, consequentialism outcomes tell me if AI, if when when people come to a doctor, my whole career is showing that they care about your humanity. But let me tell you, they care about their outcome. You want to get well. You'll pick the surgeon with the terrible personality. There are surgeons with great ones, but you'll pick the one with the terrible personality if you're going to be get a better result. So let AI do all the result things it can do. Mm -hmm. Most of, I gave two talks on this yesterday here. Most of what people need in healthcare, unfortunately, or not, I don't, most is the wrong word because of public health, but a lot of what people need is dealing with things that aren't going very well. Mm -hmm. A lot of what they need is someone to help them change behaviors that are hard to change. All of that is a very subtle process that I've spent my entire career on. So I don't think it's like being a doorman. I think it's what all of psychiatry is about. Um, and it has to do with this commingling. I've written a book about this, but mm -hmm. it's a commingling of left and right brain capacities to recognize what's, some, what's at stake for someone with that shared vulnerability. And that's genuinely transformative for people. That genuinely is healing for people. So I think that we'll need more people that, that, that might be that doctors become more like really good therapists if they want to be doctors. They need to be able to deal with death and dying. They need to be able to deal with loss. They need to be able to deal with motivating you to drink a little less, exercise a little more, and really be in it with you. Um, but that wouldn't be like, I mean, again, actually, there are doormen that I know, I've known, who've had a very psychotherapeutic effect on the people they work with. But mm -hmm. you get what I'm saying. There's a lot of expertise there. Mm -hmm. But I think that if we try to go back to the question of consciousness, maybe uh, one way of going forward is to say, okay, leave the decision making to the AI. It's better at that. And let's focus on exploring consciousness and on exploring experience, experience, which is not about decision making. And I think that, um, so th th even in this sense, maybe there is no argument here. And um, if you really value experience and you really value consciousness, then you should have no problem leaving the dirty stuff of making decisions to the AI and having much more time and energy to explore this field about which we know so little. I think humanity, for practical reasons, for thousands of years, have focused so much on making decisions, on controlling, on, on manipulating. And if we can just leave that and focus on, on what we don't know, on this dark continent of consciousness, that would be a very important step forward. It would, it would mean giving up certain very deep pleasures. Um, I'm a sailor. When I was a teenager, I learned celestial navigation with a sextant and a chronometer, and I dreamt of single-handing a sailboat across the ocean and navigating by my, by my sextant. Forget it. The insurance company won't let you do it. <laughs> uh, because a GPS can do it a thousand times better and faster and safer. You just bring three GPSs along and trust the two that agree and <laughs> put the sextant nicely polished on your mantelpiece. It's completely antique, no longer. But look what's happened. It means that a certain sort of adventure, ex existential adventure, a certain sort of challenge has been simply wiped off the planet. Mm -hmm. Here's something you just can't do anymore. And unless you're a sort of uh, antique technology nut or something, and you get the insurance companies to sign off, and then you go and you do your foolhardy, romantic, foolish thing. But I don't know if we've taken the measure of how much, I mean, that's a very dramatic case, at least for me. Uh, I don't know if we've taken the measure on just how much our finite, fragile lives will be tamed, over-tamed by the reliance on technology, turning us into uh, hyper-cautious, hyper-fragile, hyper-dependent beings. And whether the fact that we get a smile on our face all day long and are well-fed will make up for that. Mm -hmm. So before I open the, the floor to questions, I, I want to ask, Jody, how does that sound to you? We're going we're to become hyper-fragile, 
we're all going to need you. What, does that does that make sense? Well, I think the last part about needing me is a good place to go, yeah. which is about needing care, mm -hmm. needing to care. For, again, I you know because my work's on empathy, I always take it back to the. I mean, there's two basic parts of the person or the self that we brought up quite a bit today. One had to, has to do with autonomy and experiencing that with the sailing and the moral responsibility of that. And the other part had to do with relationality. And we brought that up quickly, but I want to go back to that because the most interesting, a lot of you are in the real world where you're doing these things already. And I've traveled and I've seen the robotic pets that are being used with elders with dementia right now. Mm -hmm. I was thinking, you know, if you're lonely and you have uh, a pet. I'm very attached to my dog in real life, and that's an interesting thing. Um, but I mean, do, let's say it, we're not. Let's say theoretically, and we said already that some of us think it's problematic to make colleagues rather than uh, instruments or helpers mm -hmm. out of AI. But it looks like we are going. Yeah. Some of you here in that direction. So there will be dementia caregivers yep. that will feel like a person that cares about you. Yep. And I love Dan's point about the. the I mean, the Turing. I mean, I'm really interested in working with you on that issue of how Turing's mistake of emphasizing deception is the test, because basically we've, we've, we've decided that if we can make people believe something is really a person, we've solved the moral problem in a way. Um, so if you're, uh, an, I mean, I'm really curious what all of you would feel if you were an elder with dementia and you had this wonderful caregiver and loved them and felt they, that they loved you and you didn't know that they were AI, is there anything wrong with that? I'm just interested that's what people question. think about that. Where's the loss there? Yeah, that's, yeah. That, that's, a, that's a very good question. And yes, I, I agree with you entirely that the, the cutting edge, as far as I can see, for humanoid AI is elder care. And if you look back, you don't have, I remember in my youth, I'm that old, there were still telephone operators by the thousands. Not a nice life, really. A really quite tedious nine to five job. And of course, those jobs all got wiped out. And we applaud. We think, good, that's not any way for a human being to spend a life. Well, I have to say that taking care of demented people is not my idea of a good life. And there's going to be more and more need for people to take care of our parents, <laughs> myself, in a few years. <laughs> <laughs> and so I face quite directly the issue that Jody raises. And uh, I think the key in what she said was deception. And the question is whether or not we can let people whether or not people will get the benefit with AIs that are very responsive but wear their non-humanity on their sleeves. And I think that's possible. Uh, some of you may remember, a, 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 it's now sort of antique, a science fiction film called, um, oh gosh, Short Circuit which had the most amazing robot, looked sort of like a praying mantis. <laughs> Didn't really have a face. It had cameras and it had these sort of flappers that were sort of like eyebrows. I think the designers of that robot went out of their way to make this as non-humanoid as you can imagine. But they also did a brilliant job of making you care and, and making it uh, seem like a and like a friend, like somebody that you would want to befriend and worry about its future. Uh, so I think it's possible. Uh, for me, I think I would just like three robots to play bridge with. <laughs> 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 so I couldn't do that anymore. So on that note, um, if you have a question, please raise your hand and Robert at the back of the room will run over with the microphone right. and, and, and please do wait for him. So who has questions for our panel? Yes, I, uh, I see someone right in the second row there. Hi, thank you for a fascinating discussion. Um, we're talking really about how we, I mean, regulate, but how we think about our relationship with AI. And we're kind of 
edging towards the idea that society may have a view or we're trying to inform society's view on that. But my question is that this is all taking place at a time when we are peculiarly fragmented as societies and technology itself is, is pushing that fragmentation in different ways. Um, we also have different cultural understandings around this. So we, you know, a lot of the discussion around uh, regulation of AI in the West is about, well, the Chinese are going ahead and they have so much data and they're doing so much that if you stop us in any way, we're going to lose the battle. And it's a kind of arms race in this, uh, which I think is a, a difficult argument too. So I just wonder if you can think of any optimistic, uh, you know, threads of thought that can uh, address those two issues. Any optimism here? <laughs> well, it's, um, it's tempting to think that the good old marketplace will take care of a lot of this and th that a lot of the brave ventures, most of them, most of them, are going to be dis discarded, dismissed, ignored by, by the potential customers for them. But we have to bear in mind that some of them, and we're already seeing this with children, some of them may be addictive. And that is very, very pessimistic, I think. I am very worried about that. So we'll, we'll end the optimistic answer on a pessimistic <laughs> note. We have a question up here in the front row, Kobe. Yeah, so suppose you could uh, program AI to be, take the decision that the most beneficial, so we won't call it compassionate, but always most beneficial. So what do you think of the value of the process of becoming compassionate? So the vast ex richness of experience of the, of the challenges and how you solve them, that could also help you to help companions who are on the way. Mm -hmm. And by the way, you know, if you spend some time, say, in a hermitage, cultivating compassion is certainly not about decision making, but become, becoming a better human being. So that process is to have gone through the journey is highly enriching, and that also helps you to help your human fellows to become compassionate in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that. Um if you, if you spend less time on decision making and uh, with the feeling that, oh, I control everything, so it's very important what decision I make and so forth, if you spend less time of, on that, you have far more time and energy to um, explore yourself, to explore your consciousness, your experience, and thereby develop your compassion. Now, I think that you also need some real life experiences, of course, to do that. But um, my impression, I mean, again, looking from Davos, so I'm not sure that the people who make the most important decisions in the world are by definition also the most compassionate. <laughs> so, so certainly there is no easy direct link between making decisions, being compassionate. It's much more complicated than that. And again, my impression from meeting people at the, at, the, at the top of the business world and at the top of the political world is that if they had some free time from making decisions, uh, that would be great for them and also great for the world because they are so busy making decisions, they don't have time, uh, for example, to develop their compassion. I just want to add something linking all these things. I think that I love that point, I th and I think it shows where we don't have to be sort of happy fools. Um, you know, uh, I mean, it wouldn't be so bad to be happy, right? But anyway, <laughs> for everyone to be happy. But um, I think that the uh, the giving up decision making to some degree, which is an interesting thought, to be able to really become a deeper self and deeper in our relational and spiritual lives. I do think this notion, we're not giving up moral responsibility. So that's extremely important, is we don't have the concept yet for how this goes, where you don't just give your decisions off to, to AI the way you would to an authoritarian leader. You're not just passively feeling like your steps are predicted. It's much more like a tragic view of the world where you realize, which may be closer to the truth even without AI, which is our decisions are not really, they're not that rational to begin with, 
and they're not really that determinative of what happens, as we think, most of the time. We don't have the power and control over lives that we think we have anyway. So a very deep awareness that we're morally responsible for each other, and yet we don't have the power to change each other the way we think we do or to control other people. We can barely control ourselves. So it, it gives us a very different moral vision. It does, but I think um, you say we don't have the power we think we do to control others. And yet, I think we should also acknowledge that whatever we do, we do with a little help from our friends. Yes. And that in fact, having friends, having people whose respect we cherish is one of the great uh, stiffeners of the spine, the moral spine. Uh, uh, parents will automatically not engage in behaviors in front of their children that if their children weren't there, they would probably succumb to that urge to indulge in those behaviors. And if AI removes that wonderful companionship association where, in effect, as you said, I think, it's not just that we take responsibility for our own actions, we take partial responsibility for the actions of our family and friends. Yes. And the, this whole web of moral responsibility and respect is itself in jeopardy now. And that's a very scary thought. So we have a question of this gentleman in the third row, go back. Thank you, fascinating discussion. I would like to hear your view in terms of, uh, so given that most of the repetitive jobs will progressively disappear, where do you see what is left for humans in terms of where will we be more uh, relatively competitive? What jobs, if you could give us examples? And secondly, what type of advice would you give to our children in terms of how they should orientate their careers accordingly? Um, I think that uh, we need to protect the humans, not the jobs. There are many jobs not worth protecting. <laughs> and um, if we can protect the humans, then it doesn't really matter so much if they have a job, if they don't have a job, which kind of job. Uh, on a more practical and realistic level, what kind of skills, for example, to, to acquire today so that you would still be relevant, not just economically, but also socially in 30 years or 40 years, we don't have any idea how the world would look like, except that it will be completely different from today. So any investment in a narrow skill, in a particular skill, is a dangerous bet. Uh, the best bet is to invest in emotional intelligence and in mental resilience, in the ability to, to face change, in the ability to change yourself and to constantly reinvent yourself, because this is definitely going to be needed more than in any previous time in history. Of course, the big question is how do you learn something like that? It's not something that you can just read in a book or just hear a lecture and that's it. I'm now mentally resilient. I can face the world better. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So next to the gentleman who just asked the question. Thank you very much for a fascinating discussion. I'm uh, coming from Russia, from a big bank, where we, of course, um, implementing a lot of AI. But on the other hand, uh, Elon Musk said that we have 5 to 10% chances of controlling how AI will develop. And um, we also have an education fund, and we worry a lot that kids are growing up um, increasingly in a virtual world uh, and already are losing some of the skills, and they're not only navigating, they're much more basic. Uh, so what do you think are our chances of not finishing in a matrix like future? And what can we do, like big businesses, politicians, uh, to prevent it? <laughs> you stumped them. Uh, well, one thing I can say is that we are already in a kind of matrix anyway. We have been for thousands of years. It's, uh, um, so, so it's not a completely new uh, situation. And what can businesses and, and, and politicians uh, do? I think the first step, uh, and that goes back to the first question that was asked here, any solution will have to be on a global level. Because of the danger of the race to the bottom, 
that no country and no business would like to stay behind. If, for example, to take a simple case, a simple, uh, it's still complicated, but relatively simple in moral terms, um, developing autonomous weapon systems is a terrible idea for many reasons. But we are seeing now an arms race all over the world to develop autonomous weapon systems. And even to stop, the, even though it's, it's, it's very clear, I think, the ethical debate on that, that it's a very bad idea, it's still very, very difficult to stop it. Because even if one country, Russia or the US, whatever, says, okay, it's a bad idea, we are not going to do it, then they look across the border and they see that the Europeans or the Chinese or somebody is doing it, and they say, oh, we are not fools, we don't want to stay behind. So even though we know that it's bad, which means we are moral, and it's important that the moral people will be the most powerful, so we must develop it, because we will be more responsible in using it. So let's develop it. And, and this is the logic of, of the race to the bottom. And the only way to effectively prevent the development of autonomous weapon systems is by global cooperation. And this is like a no-brainer, no but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's the world is, is, at least in the last few years, going in exactly the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. So before we think about any practical method, uh, we need far more effective global cooperation. Otherwise, almost nothing will work. So let's take one more question <clears throat> down front here. Okay. Thank you, and thank you for a fabulous discussion. It's really exciting. Um, my question is uh, related to a Davos theme this year, which has been gender. To hmm. what extent can uh, artificial intelligence be gendered? What would it mean? And could we eliminate things like unconscious bias if AI could be gendered? Oh, that's a good question. And it's particularly important because as my colleague and friend Joanna Bryson has shown recently, the deep learning systems that sieve through all the material on the internet are so good at capturing patterns that they have become gender biased. Right there. Since they're parasitic on the communications of human beings, they have already, this has been discovered, she proves that this is a, a real feature and a very serious one. Uh, I can say two things about this issue. First of all, there is a real problem of AI becoming gender biased. The, the bright side is that, at least in theory, it should be easier to eliminate this in AI than in humans because AI doesn't have a subconscious. I mean, in humans, you can, somebody can agree with you completely that it's terrible to discriminate against women, against gays, whatever. But they are not aware of what is happening on the subconscious level. So it's very, very difficult to change that in humans. Uh, luckily, AI doesn't have a subconscious. Oh, well, so, well, uh, so, uh, so in theory, it could be easier. <laughs> Um, the other point, uh, more, more broadly, is that it's very interesting. I mean, even the Turing test was originally, Turing gave two examples, not only about convincing a human that the machine is, uh, is a human, but also about passing as, a, as somebody from the other gender. And you see it throughout, especially in science fiction, it always comes back somehow to the issue of gender. Like 90-something percent of the science fiction movies, the plot is you have a male scientist, and the AI of the robot is usually female. And I think that most of these films are not about AI at all. They are not, they are about feminism. It's not humans afraid of intelligent robots, it's men afraid of intelligent women. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay, well, no one wants to follow that, so. <laughs> Well, I want to thank our panel. Uh, you guys have been absolutely brilliant. Uh, thank you for thank you. helping us make really important distinctions among the self, intelligence, consciousness, for giving us smarter questions to chew on ourselves, and, and for sending us out in the world so that we're not happy fools. Yeah. So, and thank you all for your terrific questions. Yeah.
Thank you.